All right. Hey guys, Dr. Greg here. And on today's episode of the Daily Dose of Dr. Greg, I have Michaela Stoner with. Michaela is uh, has many things. She's a certified personal trainer. She's a nutritionist. She's a coach to moms, to execs, and really her secret ninja skills lie in the ability to manage chaos. If, if I could call it something different than that, whether it's kids, whether it's it's a business, whether it's a busy lifestyle, because um, life didn't come with an owner's manual to say, how do we handle all these things? The catch though, is we typically have our own journey, Michaela, to get there. But first off, thank you for spending some time with me today. Of course. I'm so grateful that you decided to ask me to come on. I actually follow you on Instagram and I'm always getting your videos and your reels. And I have honestly learned so much from you in just the last couple of months of following you that I was really excited to hop on here today and be able to have a good conversation about wellness and health. And hopefully your listeners can get something out of this. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for for listening many, many years ago, a patient just said to me, Dr. Greg, who do you think you are knowing what you know and not sharing it with everybody? And that was really convicting, right? You know, we have we have our own journeys. I had a journey. Um, I mean, I was at the Mayo Clinic in 1998 and my dad handed me his wedding ring when he walked into cancer surgery. And that was my shift. I realized that I was in medical school at the time. I wanted to be a doctor, but that changed my why of what is, who am I gonna be inside of the healing world? So. I love our journeys. I want to know what your journey is, though, because you don't just all of a sudden say, hey, I want to, because you do heavy lifting for people. I mean, the reality is you might make it look fun and sound enjoyable, yet it's like you have to have a passion. So, Michaela, how did you get from, from growing up in Blaine, Minnesota, and then transitioning to Florida, and then back to Minnesota, and having kids, like, take us on a, on a journey? Yeah, so I was in the, I would say, fitness space my entire life. I grew up an elite gymnast. I was at the highest level you can actually achieve in junior Olympic gymnastics when I was in third grade. So I excelled so fast. <laughs> yeah, my parents were like, whoa, pump the brakes. Um, but I just, uh, that's my personality of when I get in front of something, I'm, I'm driven and I'm determined and I'm dedicated to it. And so I was in that space and I went through all of the wellness things. I saw physical therapists all the time for overuse injuries. I, we talked about nutrition a lot just as an adolescent. And when I started going through puberty, it was talking about how do I take care of my body now that I'm growing at such a significant rate and trying to excel in performance. Mm -hmm. So that's really where I think I just fell in love with this in general because it was my life. Right. Um, then I went into college and I didn't know initially what I wanted to do, but I was dealing with some issues personally on a physical level with some disordered eating mm. and hormonal imbalances. And um, I was put on birth control to fix them. I was put on an antidepressant. Mm. There's a lot of things from the um, Western med medicine side of things that I started doing all of it. And I was like, I feel worse. Right. I don't feel better. I really want to figure out what's going on in a holistic manner. And so with my education, as I was going through school, I decided that I was really going to implement a more holistic stance on things. Because when you go through school as a nutritionist, they teach you the clinical side. Right. So I learned the clinical side and then I was like, okay, now I want to shift and actually learn the more Eastern medicine holistic, natural side of things. And that's just where I started down that path. And I dove headfirst into everything that I could just to treat myself and right. to treat some family members and to help them. And it really just became a passion of mine to start helping other people. And, and it started slow, like you seeing it with your dad. And then I, I, I wanted to help my dad and I wanted to help my mom and cousins started coming and asking me questions and from there, I just was like, I need to do this for a living. So you started, I started with the hardest people possible. No one, right? the, the hardest clients in the world are your direct family, because you're still like the elite level gymnast. I always tell my patients, I was a snot nosed inside linebacker until my parents realized, oh, this guy's actually like giving his life to help people. So good for you. You, 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 you hit the, you hit the hard button first. No doubt about that. I definitely did. I'm not going to say it was easy. And there are times where I've still had to help them along the way, but it's a lifestyle and it's a journey that's, you know, long-term. So, 
um, yeah, that's really where I started. And then I worked with professional athletes for a while outside of college, um, just fell in love with the nutrition performance side because I saw what they were um, on a high level giving their athletes to perform at a professional environment. Right. And so then I started pairing my fitness experience, my education, and the experience that I had with those professional athletes. And I just found a niche I really enjoyed working with, which was specifically women until I became a mom. And then I realized I really like moms. Yes. So, yeah, it's funny you say that I, uh, had to date myself a little bit. This would have been 2004. I was doing some of my really in-depth um, functional medicine training. I was actually at a seminar um, with Mark Hyman and training along with him. And I was we were at a hotel where uh, the University of Washington football team was playing USC. And this the, the hotel was where USC was playing. And this was Saturday morning game day. And, and I'm in this like super in-depth functional medicine training class. And I go out into the lobby and there are tables with stacks of pizza boxes to feed the men before a division one college football team. And I remember going, Oh my word, really? They're going to put, they're going to put that fuel in that racehorse and hope he wins the Kentucky Derby. And that was, but again, I think it's important for us to see some of those realities And then like you, I've had a chance to work with some professional athletes. I actually worked with the Olympic wrestling team in the world of nutrition. And that is a whole nother world because you're cutting people to like 3% body fat. And I even, I came from, my mom was actually a home ec major when I grew up. So, and she taught me how to cook. So I would actually cook meals for this one athlete to to make his cuts. Um, The catch though. So, so obviously there's two sides of it, just because they're a professional athlete doesn't mean that they really understand nutrition but the question I would ask you is what is the, what is like the couple observations that you made with the professionals that you have now parlayed with you and a mom with a, with a young child, they're getting the same advice. What is that advice that you learned at that high level? So starting at the high level, a couple of things that were really adamant, they were really adamant about doing that. I just didn't have a whole lot of experience until I saw it and then was able to also implement it in with my own body and my clients was looking at um, deficiencies and things that were going on within the athlete that were causing them to either get injured all the time or just perform at a low level. Mm -hmm. And so I was in charge actually of like the supplementation and I would stand in front of the table and, and I knew what their programs were. And so I was giving them their beta alanine and all of these different things for performance to help them perform at such a high level. Mm-hmm. And same thing goes with, with my moms that I work with and just women in general. And there, it's not to say that it isn't the men as well, but uh, some of the tennis pl- professional tennis players were women that I was working with and that I got to see some of their supplementation, which was vastly different, honestly, than the men. Big time. And So that's where I really learned, okay, so there are things that are beneficial for like, what's the most bioavailable protein. They didn't just have any random protein that they bought at GNC with that these athletes were taking, Yeah, you know, looking, looking at the quality, looking at what they were actually putting into their bodies to refuel their bodies after workout, but before a workout, it was so powerful to see it from a a nourishing standpoint Mm -hmm. of you saw it a little bit different because wrestlers, you are trying to cut (sighs) and crazy. (laughs) I saw it from like a just nourishment, nourishment, performance. I bought an NFL. And so, yeah, let's go there. You hit on a hot topic and I'm not going to let you skip over it because it is like, I get asked five times a week, what protein, what, what is the best protein powder out there? What, what should I be taking? Um, and, and, and I guess it's, there's probably not the best, but there's definitely some reasons of, of good, better, best. So what, how do you walk people through the tubs upon tubs upon bags of things and how to figure out what's best for them? Yeah. So normally I just have a couple of go-to proteins that I do recommend. I know a really hot topic right now is, and this has been a hot topic for years and years of what's better vegan or way way, collagen, right? collagen. There's so many different things. And my main question that I always ask them before we even touch base on 
what's in your protein, but what's your goal? Like, why do you, why do you want to take the protein? Mm -hmm. And then we can stem from is collagen better for you or is a just traditional protein better for you? Cause you're looking at the amino acids and how they're being absorbed into your body. Are they working in, in better for your skin and your organs? And specifically my mamas, when I'm talking to them about proteins, it's collagen versus a traditional protein and working on your connective tissue and healing your core and collagen is really great for that. So looking at all of the different forms of protein and my main go-to when asking people, A, what's your goal is then also B, what, if you have a protein, because a lot of people will get, bring, like bring a protein and they're like, is this good? We think about <laughs> this doc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, or there's a couple of big collagens out there on Instagram and I get so many messages. How is this collagen? Would you recommend this collagen? And so I always just say, look at the quality, look at where is the protein coming from? Is it coming from a clean, healthy source? Even if it's a whey protein and you deal, you handle whey well, um, or like casein well, it's looking at where, where is this coming from? What, what cow, where did, the, where was the cow? Was it like, let's go way back. I always tell people what, well, tell me about Bessie, the cow that it came from, right? And so when you talk about traditional protein, I assume that you're talking about the ways and the caseins, and then we have all the other ones outside of that. The catch though with protein, and I'm sure it's not just what is the protein, but it's all of the other What's in litany it? of crap that they put inside those things. So what would be, what would be your, um, I don't care how good the protein is, if it has this, this, or this on the ingredient label, it's blacklisted. What are your like watch out ingredients? Okay. Um, major ingredients are maltodextrin, um, sucralose, any type of artificial color and dyes. Mm -hmm. I'm mixing all of those. Um, you know, really what people don't, I think sometimes what people struggle with is it's very overwhelming. Right. The food industry is so overwhelming because now you can even look at the color, the dyed colors, and they're changing the names of the dyed colors. So it no longer says red, red it number says 40, right. that you, you can't get away from, from it. You have to be so on top of the education that it, it can be really overwhelming, which it's helpful then looking at the panel and maybe on the front, it says glyphosate free, love it, you know? Um, and, or it'll say GMO, like non GMO, the things that it, that it claims to have on the front is helpful, but it's also helpful to read the label on the back and go, right. okay, I'm not going to have um, canola oil. I'm not going to have sunflower oil, which that one's really hard to get away, away from right now. Any type of seed oil is really yeah. challenging. Any hydrogenated oils, um, but added artificial sugars are my number one thing where I'm like, what are the artificial sugars that are in it? Aspartame. Um, and it's funny, right? Because this world's all carb conscious, right? So they're like, okay, you're saying that sucralose is bad or aspartame is bad. And I'm like, yes. And I had a PhD student as a patient of mine last week, kind of like dig into me, like, you got, you got to tell me more, Dr. Greg. And, I, and, and the research is actually unequivocal, right? We know that aspartame is neural toxic. Like it literally can attack neural tissue. And then sucralose, uh, Splenda, completely jacks up the microbiome, right? So you have this stuff and yes, it's sweet. So that's part of it. So, so yes, artificial sweeteners are a no-no. And then the other part of this thing is the stuff still has to taste good, right? So, Correct. so um, the palatability is also a whole nother component inside of it. And, and the ones you're hearing about, and this is no offense to these companies, but the more money, the less money you spend on the product and the more you charge for it is the more money that you have for marketing in a lot of cases. And, and I say this, Michaela, and this is not to toot my own horn, but I made a protein for this wrestler and the team, and I will never do it again. It was the most work we've ever done. And we used, we used um, grass-fed, um, free-range organic collagen. That's not easy to find. We actually put pre- and probiotics into it. We put glutamine into it. We sweetened it with, with stevia. And then when the second batch we did with, um, with monk fruit, and it is not, it is so expensive to make that stuff. 
So, um, so now with that, with that aside, there still are some, and, and, and we're not sponsored by any protein companies and maybe you are, and that's good if you are, what would be like currently at the recording of this in February of 2023, what would be your top couple go-to brands that you think are doing a good job? I personally love perfect supplements, um, collagen and protein. That's what I take myself. It tastes good enough that my kids love it. I'll take a scoop of the chocolate collagen and I'll literally just put it in water in the morning because mm -hmm. get into this, but blood sugar stabilization for my oldest kiddo who is having some behavioral mm -hmm. stuff going. Um, I just give it to him in the morning with a couple of his other supplements and he loves it. So perfect supplements is a really great one. A lot of my clients take that as well and they love it. I like to also just take a, a unflavored scoop and throw it into my half calf coffee in the morning. There you go. Um, you know, a matcha latte or something like that, just again, for blood sugar stabilization sake. Um, I've also for years for a dairy free solution, really love Organifi's mm -hmm. protein. Um, and I actually love all of their products in general. They have really great um, reds juice, which has a lot of hormone balancing properties to it that I really love as well. Um, the natural source of energy. So when I'm working with a lot of my clients that are just sitting back all day or at home at the office or at home, just pounding coffee, um, it's a really good opportunity for them to get on some of those supplements mm -hmm. just as a tool right. to help support food first, because okay. at the end of the day, these protein powders and everything else are great additives, but I never want that to be the main priority for somebody in their life. Cause you can't, you can't eat junk or, or malnourish and under eat yourself and then just pump yourself with a bunch of products right. and think that you're balanced. That's so good, Michaela. I do want to kind of transition into the world of the women that are listening to this, that are like, Hey, I want to be a mama or they've tried the, the mama route and it's not working so hot. And they realize that it's not just a, a hormonal conversation. There's an emotional conversation. There's a dietary conversation. There's a cyclical conversation. So let's 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 first talk about fitness or okay. the definition of fitness and preparing the body to be mama. Talk to me about how your your approach to that. So if, so if you have a whatever age this what a young a young couple that is now like hey we want to have babies and the mom is like I want to make sure I am as good as I can be to to walk through yeah. this. Yeah, absolutely. So whenever I am working with a woman that is in her preconception phase of just looking to get pregnant, prior to that, I really hope they're coming to me at least three months prior to thinking that they're going to conceive. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much research around the fact that your body really needs some time to nourish your ovaries and everything that's going to be happening within your body to create that life. Right. And you don't want to go into it in a point of being malnourished. Now that's not to say that your baby's going to be harmed. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you don't do that, if you get pregnant and maybe you weren't expecting it or whatever that conversation looks like, it's okay. But when I'm talking to a woman, I love it when I can do it at least three months prior to them wanting to conceive and really getting to a point where we are focusing on nourishing their bodies with really good bioavailable sources of certain things. So I like beef liver um, as just leading into them getting pregnant, mm -hmm. desiccated beef liver, raw beef liver is great. Not very many of my clients want to chop up beef liver and throw it into a smoothie. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, taking a couple of supplements to really prepare their bodies because doctors tell you to take a prenatal. Mm -hmm. So if you're open to taking something that's more bioavailable for your body, like beef liver, and then pairing that with an oyster extract, which not only is it going to prepare your body for pregnancy, but oyster extracts actually going to help your libido spike. So if you're dealing with some issues of low libido, during that phase of trying to get pregnant, oyster extracts really great for you if you can handle shellfish mm. and different forms of um, a supplementation like that. So magnesium, uh, 
a good source of cod liver oil since a lot of issues that I see are a deficiency in a really good quality vitamin A, specifically retinol, mm -hmm. um, and just making sure you're feeding your body with the best holistic things possible to prep you for pregnancy. The same thing goes for fitness. You want to be in a good space where you're strengthening your body and regulating your blood sugars along with your insulin and cortisol, which play a role in that. Mm -hmm. um, with fitness, exercise, studies show exercise help with that. And so getting your, your body to a good place where if you don't do anything at all right now, just increase your movement, mm -hmm. just focus on if you're not, if you're not even getting 5,000, 8,000 steps in a day, let's just start with getting in consistent walks right. and, and nourishment, and then go, move into, okay, now that we have just a good, consistent uh, movement pattern, now let's talk about strengthening your body. Because you also do want to go into pregnancy with a strong body, with a core that can handle that pregnancy. Like mm -hmm. you can gain 25 to 45, even 50 ish healthy pounds if that's what your body wants to do. Right. Um, and you need a foundation that's going to carry you and baby through full term comfortably. Right. So, and come out the other side now being able to mother that little one, as opposed to like, holy Toledo, you just took it out of me nine months and now I'm tapped. And now you want to nurse 12 times a day, right? So uh, you have five, excuse me, three little kids, five years old and younger. What were some of the things that you thought you might have known about mental health, emotional health, nutrition, how to, how to take care of moms that your children taught you that you got to learn from them about being the best version of you as you manage pregnancy, little ones, and, and all of that stuff. Oh my goodness. What did I learn from them? From their pregnancies, I definitely learned that each pregnancy and each kiddo is its own ball game. It's, okay. you can even think you know it all, but really having somebody in your corner to walk you through those phases of life. And I'm talking from a wellness standpoint, whether you have a coach, a nutritionist, a trainer, whether you have a holistic doctor, somebody in your corner that is going to be able to help support you through that process, I definitely learned was essential. Because sometimes you go into it and you're like, I'm fine. And then you get in there I've and you like, abort mission, like, I'm not fine. Somebody help me out here. Yeah. I can't do this. So um, being able to have somebody in your corner is super important, I think. And so I learned that just through all three of my pregnancies. And then I think you just can't really speak to it until you go through it. But that postpartum journey is a wild ride. And hormonally, um, I had really bad diastasis recti with my first because he was nine and a half pounds. Oh my God. My Out of a little gymnast comes a nine and a half pound baby. You poor thing. So what I, Did I you mean, marry like an NBA center or something? You got a, that's a big baby girl. And was he full term or did he go late? He was two weeks late. Okay. So he's doing things on his own time and probably still does things that way. Uh, yes. <laughs> All of my children were, my middle child was a week and one day late. And my other two children were almost two weeks late. Lovely. So, but studies show that if you are carrying us, if you work out during your pregnancy, strength train and work out consistently during your pregnancy, you may go over your due date. That's not a bad thing. It is not scary and it's not a bad thing. Baby's comfortable and the more nourishment that baby is getting from you before those days that baby comes out and then takes a few days for your milk supply and stuff to come in, like the better. So although it was frustrating and I got very <laughs> impatient at times, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that whole postpartum process after that was definitely another full learning curve for me. And I'm so grateful for it because now having three different experiences, I can really help other women. I feel in a more tangible way because I can relate to what they're going through um, from the hormone standpoint, point, from diastasis recti standpoint, from pelvic floor standpoint, and really be able to navigate and pivot with them when they run into something that they need help with that um, they don't know how to fix. Or even if I can't help them with it, being able to get somebody in there to help support them with whatever they're going through. Right. I definitely, I, I'd love to comment on the, 
you know, women have a 40 week gestational period. And I'm like, you know what you doctor with your little turny thing and last period. And are you trying to tell me that you're more intelligent than the bean inside of my womb and that they don't know when it's time to come out? Like, come yeah. on now. And so I've, I've always kind of taken that bent of like, just because you got a white coat and a stethoscope does not make you smarter than 75 trillion cells inside of my wife's womb right now. Um, the, what, what would you say would be the number one thing that you wished either you knew or every woman would know walking into postpartum stages? What is that one thing that if you could put, if you could have a billboard to speak to every woman about postpartum, what would that billboard say? Well, the one thing that I always say to all of my mamas, and it's a saying that I've lived out myself and that I say to them, but you were somebody before you were their mom and she still matters mm -hmm. because after you have that child, they always will be your number one priority. Biologically, we're never going to change that. However, being able to acknowledge that you are also important enough to be a priority and that it is important to eat and that it is important to take time for yourself and to step away when you need to or to take the Epsom salt bath, um, that it's okay to also do that as well. And so if I could just put up a ton of billboards in all of the world, that's exactly what it would say. Like, take the time. You are worth it. You, um, I know you love your babies very much, mm -hmm. but if you're not taking care of yourself, you cannot take care of them in the way that you could. Like your optimal health is only going to help you be a better mom, a better wife, a better human. Right. Michaela, that's a, that's definitely a weekend seminar, what you just said there. And I think women feel selfish, which used to, it, I used to think selfish was a bad term. Now I think it's actually a very appropriate thing though. I think what I, what I try to say to women uh, and I'm a dude, so it may not land the same way is like, for example, my wife and I have, we have five kids, we have three girls. And what I, what I say to my wife is when you take care of yourself, you are showing our girls what it's like to value yourself and to prioritize yourself. And, and if you come into this and you are sacrificing yourself at, at, at everyone's expense, then you have trained your girls to someday when they're in a marriage and have their own babies, they're going to be frustrated. And then if they have the ability to look back there and go, because my mom, this is what my mom taught me how to do this. So, yeah. so if, so if you don't have the ability to say, I'm worth it, or I'm going to do it for me, do it for your grandbabies, right? Yeah. Do, it, do it for your future son-in-laws so that they can have that conversation around that. Now, I'm going to jump into this because this is a big one. Um, the, the whole conversation of under eating and postpartum and women are trying to get back to their size and hormones shift. And, and this world, I've heard, I've had thousands of women that have walked into my practice that have, that are battling with weight and the doctors um, who should get punched in the throat for saying this should say, just eat less and exercise more. And, and these poor women are like, dude, if I showed you my, my fitness pal and my workouts, there's no way I should look like this. Um, right. And I think under eating, and you even spoke to a, a past with some some you know adverse um, relationships with food. This again is a whole nother weekend seminar. But if you would just speak to that a little bit, and maybe give the listeners the the right to understand, and then some tools to take action. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when we become mothers, or just anybody in general, even if you're not a mother or a father being able to give yourself the opportunity to eat what is appropriate for your body and nourish yourself is really important because everything that you put or don't put into your body is programming your body chemistry. And so under eating and depriving yourself of food because you feel like you need to earn it or whatever that may look like, whatever is going on in your head that you may have some sort of distorted relationship with food, um, being able to just give yourself permission to eat the food that's going to nourish your body rather than focusing so much on this low carb, low calorie thing is going to be way healthier and it's going to give you so much more um, um, in the long run, you're going to get so much more out of it than you think. You think you're doing yourself a favor by focusing on your macros and um, 
which can be a slippery slope for a lot of people, because if it fits your macros, in my opinion, yeah. um, more often than not is not really a healthy approach to it. I think that macros can be a really good tool to help you figure out what you're eating and how you're nourishing your body. And if you're getting enough, more often than not, I see women that aren't getting enough. And that's a whole, that's a whole epidemic, honestly, because so many women right now are under eating in the mornings. They're, they're fasting under eating in the mornings, but just, just pouring coffee into their mouth Mm -hmm. and their body's response, their stress response, their cortisol is through the roof, or they get to a point where they do it so long and they've malnourished their bodies so long that they don't even have a really good, healthy cortisol spike and drop throughout the day. So then you've got cravings and you have so many things that you feel like you're struggling for, for willpower Mm -hmm. and motivation. And that's not, that's not what it's about. That's not the main culprit here. Um, so being able to eat enough, I would just tell people to constantly focus on balanced meals instead of tracking your food. If that's overwhelming to you, um, just balance meals, eat a good quality source of a carb, eat vegetables and protein forward, eat fruit forward, focus on maybe even micronutrients rather than macronutrients. Mm -hmm. So that you're really feeding your body at least multiple times a day, since a lot of what I see is you don't eat all day long, and then you eat this huge meal at dinner. Well, now you're starving, and you've spiked so many things going on within your body that then you want to backload. So then you're like, well, I didn't eat all day, so then I can eat dessert too, right. which then trips you into this huge thing that you're you're back heavy and your blood sugars are through the roof. A lot of people then start to struggle with. Um, insulin resistance issues or insulin sensitivity issues. And I mean, then it's kind of a slippery slope where you have somebody sitting in front of you that's 160 pounds. They're like, I'm not really overweight, but I just went into the doctor and they told me I'm Mm pre-diabetic. Okay. Well, what does your nutrition look like? Most of the time under eating, malnourished, drinking a ton of coffee or energy drinks, or what I see a lot of is diet Coke or something in the morning because they're not drinking coffee. And I'm like, that's no better. It's actually way worse, right? Because the, the studies are actually showing that aspartame makes you gain weight. I mean, yep. if, they had, if they had to put that study on a Diet Coke bottle, Coke would stop producing Diet Coke. Well, you know? yeah. So anyway, sorry, Coke, if you're going to try to come after me. Um, but that's the thing, right? I mean, it, we have to speak up. And, and, you know, what I hate for someone to say to people like ourselves is, how come you never told me? So that's why we have to take a stand. That's why we have to be on social media. That's why we have to just really empower these mama bears. And the reality is we've talked about a ton of stuff on this podcast and the listeners probably like, great, no wonder why I'm not healthy. I have to do all these things, but that's when you need a guide beside you. And we're going to, we're going to pump the brakes for a little, a little commercial break. And then, and then I want to jump into just some of like, what does it look like for you to come alongside of somebody and help them on their journey? So we'll be right back. This podcast is sponsored by Life Boost Coffee. Clean, organic, and non-toxic ingredients are important for your health, and Life Boost Coffee is no exception. Go to coffeewithdoc.com to receive 50% off your first order. That's coffeewithdoc.com. All right, guys, we are back, and we have had some fun conversation in the break, and we're going to shift gears a little bit. So, Michaela, I want to jump into support systems, and especially around this whole pregnancy thing. I remember when my wife and I conceived our first child. I'm a family from a family of four boys. Uh, my mom was raised on a ranch, so I knew nothing about women, like zip, zero, zilch. And so so now the love of my life, ha- we have, she's pregnant and she's going through these things. And, and as a guy, I want to fix stuff and I want to help. And the reality was I was a duck out of water. So yeah. um, let's, so you've, we've talked about three phases, right? We've talked about preconception. We've talked about pregnancy and postpartum. And a lot of these overlap. So if, if, if a listener has went and grabbed their husband or their partner and said, Hey, you got to listen in, what would you say to that other half of the, of the group so that they can be an asset to the woman going through this journey? Yeah, that's a great question because when we got pregnant and went to go have our oldest, which is, he's almost six now, um, when you become pregnant, something happens inside of a woman and 
it just doesn't happen inside of the man because uh-huh. they're not housing the, the child. Right. And so from a motherly instinct standpoint, moms just go through something that their spouses don't get and they're not really going to comprehend through the whole process. And then even after the birth of your child, it's it's still a totally different process for that dad and that person to connect. Right. And the mom just has it. Oh my God. And it's it's a journey, but it's so natural for a woman to just have certain feelings and go through certain things that that motherly intuition is really strong. And so the one thing that I would say is if you're sitting as a partner next to somebody who is pregnant and is going through all these things and emotions and um, being convicted of certain things or becoming really passionate about learning certain things about pregnancy or about children, whatever that may look like, um, to just be very open-minded and ask questions to understand without being the fixer because you, you you don't have to be the fixer. And more often than not, in that instance, she's not looking for you to fix it <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> because you probably can't fix it. Yeah. So being the listener, being the supporter, being the person that's going to come alongside of her and find solutions together. If it is something that requires finding a solution together, mm-hmm. um, example, uh, your spouse is pregnant and wants to find somebody else or a different place or a different care um, team for her birth. I say this because I went through the same thing. I was 31 weeks pregnant and I looked at my husband and I was like, this something just doesn't feel right about this. I need to find a different birthing team. Yeah. 31 weeks. And the The clock's ticking. um, He was panicking. He's like, (laughs) what? No, we know these midwives. We, we know, we know this clinic. And I was like, I, I, this, I need to do this. Mm -hmm. And he was, I will say he was really great about just saying, okay, you know yourself best. He's very intuitive and supportive about being in like letting me be intuitive. And so he said, let's, let's find some places and I'll come with you and I'll do that. Um, whole another topic, you know, that neither here nor there on whether or not you agree with it or not, but I became very intuitive about trying to figure out what I wanted to do for vaccinations with my child. And so being that support person, my husband thought I was absolutely crazy because I wanted to read all the books and watch all the videos to really find out what was in it. I was reading the inserts. I was digging in and just, you know, really educating myself so that I had the knowledge so that I could make a knowledgeable educated decision when it came that time. And I think the same thing happens with pregnancy is as a spouse, you just have to go, okay, this is a partnership, right? We're in, we're in this together and I trust your intuition and what you're feeling is right for you and right for baby. I know. I love that. I, I believe that every woman has an intuition. Uh, I believe everyone has an intuition, especially women. And I believe at the moment of conception, that intuition is welled up and overflowed inside of a woman. My, my wife was a two-sport college athlete, like this girl, like, let's go, like, I'm going to run something over. And and, I, and I'm not saying that my wife lost her, her competitiveness or her drive, but like, for an example, crazy adventurous, like, hey, let's go jump out of an airplane. Let's go do this crazy stuff. And my wife, Rachel, would tell you the, the, at the moment of conception, all of those crazy, um, unresponsible, harebrained ideas have never once even entered the fact again, right? So, so for the guys listening, the re- what I heard you say is there's a shift, and it's not a shift away from you. Just because it's a shift of what you've known for a month, a year, a decade with this with this person, what I want your heart to say is this is the real version of her allowing itself to come out. And, and let's say, and I'm not trying to say, and, and you're right, that shift does not happen in men. And I wanted it to, like, I remember, like, put my hand on the belly, and you can feel the baby kick and read reader stories. And and there was never that, like, uh, there was never that, even now, I wept when my babies were born, and I'm grateful for that. But there was, but that doesn't happen in guys. So I think if guys understand that, and then the research part, right, like, like, let's say I was passionate about cars. And, and I researched all these models and all the makes and all these things. 
women take their role as a mom at that level. So if they're researching who's my midwife, what's our vaccination schedule? Am I going to nurse or bottle feed? What, 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 what crib do I want? I remember, and my wife is a researcher. I'm like, and this is before, our first baby was long before even really the internet, but like she's yeah. very diligent with the things for our children. So I think, I think for the guys, it's to honor that is to honor who she is. And then, um, to acknowledge that because many women, it can be kind of a thankless deal, right? Like I just spent all this time to research this one thing and it's a big deal. So to acknowledge that, and then I really think it's important for guys to say, how can I help? You know, guys, I tell most women in my practice, guys are like puppy dogs. Um, tell them what to do, pat their head when they've done it and tell them they're a good boy. So um, so guys guys, guys want to help. So I, I honor that. And all of those questions, regardless of what our stance is on, and just because your doctor says it's what you do, it doesn't mean that you don't have to question it, right? Like like the right. myosin in the eyes. Like, like so even it, it's okay as a mom say, okay, that's interesting. What is that for? Why do yeah. we do it? And, and what if I don't? Right. And, and right. here's the thing, if you're getting pushback from your clinical team that doesn't feel right, then you might not be at the right place. And it's okay. Because if you can't answer questions, then like we talked about at the beginning of the show, then you're probably going to be the woman that's told you just need to eat less and exercise more because, because you, this is a place in your life where you get to stand up and ask questions and demand attention and realize that this is a big deal. So I, I really want the women listeners to be empowered to say, hey, I have read this information. I have valid concerns. And please don't foo-foo my concerns because I will punch you in the throat because I'm pregnant and I have emotions and it will happen, right? Um, and then for the husbands to, again, say, hey, you're doing this research. What have you found? Yeah. Tell me more. Yeah. That's interesting. So I think um, also really great when the spouse takes it into their own hands, which is what my husband did. And I was so, so grateful for this, but he took it upon himself of wanting to be my birth coach. Cause I wanted to get a doula. Yeah. And he's like, no, I can do this. I can do this as your support person. I can 100% do this and I'm going to do a darn good job at it. Yeah. So he read the Bradley method. He read, he read multiple books and then he went a step further and he was like, I, let's do that hypnobirthing thing that you were talking about. And I'm like, yes. Okay. So then we went to all of my hypnobirthing classes and, and he would lay in bed with me at night and read me mama meditations in the evening so that I could connect with baby yeah. and relax. And it, I can't tell you how powerful it was to have him at least be willing to do those things because it, I felt so supported yeah. and like he was really was my partner with me through it. That is so good. I love it. Well, we could talk about being mommies and daddies a bunch because I'm passionate about that and and whatnot. But let's let's jump into um, how do we're, we're kind of wrapping up with time here. How do our listeners find you, Michaela? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram. That's probably the best way to reach me, Michaela Stoner Fitness. Cool. I have a link there if you just want to connect and get into my schedule to hop on a call. I have my client application in there if they are looking to really work one-on-one -on -one with somebody um, and dig really deep into habit, you know, habit stacking and creating this environment within your home and within your lifestyle, within your mindset, mm -hmm. um, really take you in a place from where you have been for so long and like stop like get off the hamster wheel right so many people go through all of these different things and, and try so many things but what i really love doing with people is just going okay what's your experience let's look at the big picture what's going on with you and your body right. and then formulate the best blueprint for being able to reprogram your body chemistry because this is a holistic thing that we need to do here so if that's what they're looking for um i would love to connect cool. and chat um and then i have a website michaelastoner.com so they can always reach me there cool. so. and we'll put those into our show notes for the listeners so if they have this so michaela it's been a fun a fun time today chatting with you and getting to know you and uh, i am excited to see where your business goes from here have a great day 
great to come and, and see you and um, see more about what's going on with you guys down there as well. And I just thank you so much and appreciate all of the content and knowledge you're constantly sharing. So thanks a lot. Awesome. There you go. Um, with that being said, until next time.